major contributions. Um, I thought I had it working um, now. Just push the right button. There it is. All right. And we are dedicating this to the Eastman employees who served at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the original site of a, of a lot of the work that was done. And from 42 to 45, they subsequently, after having served at Oak Ridge, uh, came to Longview and were instrumental in setting up what was called Texas Eastman, now Eastman Chemical. And um, so these are, that will be discussed by Gail at the end of the talk. We are, you see the term critical scientific accomplishments during World War II, obviously there were many, but the two that we are limiting our talk to today have to do with the RDX explosives, which some of you may like be like I was. I had not heard of RDX prior to this learning. And then the second topic will be the actual atomic bomb uh, development. So those are the two details that we will be discussing today. We're going to start with RDX. And When you think of explosives, uh, most people, I think, come, uh, things that comes to mind is dynamite or TNT. TNT, of course, is just the first three letters, uh, letters of the first three words in the chemical name, trinitrotoluene. And that is the explosive, what people don't like to say to be chemical names, so they call it TNT. RDX explosives is a far more complex molecule. Uh, it was developed, it was discovered in the late 1800s, ironically, by the Germans. And it's a complex molecule, and you can see the chemical name at the bottom. So someone decided to give it a nickname as well, and they called it RDX, which stands simply for Research Developed Explosive. It tells you nothing about the nature of the chemical itself. The, the Germans first, the developed the material and they had intent of developing a more explosive material than TNT. But there were two major problems that quickly arose with this new chemical. And one, they did not know how to make it in large uh, commercial quantities. Uh, they had to make it in a series of little batch autoclaves and could only make a few pounds at a time. They needed a process it could make hundreds of millions of pounds if they were going to use it in the war. So that was one major problem. Uh, the second problem was the fact that it was so shock sensitive. Uh, the Germans had a test where they could drop a weight from a certain distance and hit a material and they would keep raising the height until there was enough force to make the material explode. TNT, for example, they had to raise the weight up to about 25 feet and drop it to make it explode. RDX, they had to raise it up about three or four inches. So they realized that this was a serious problem. If they had this on a ship and something bumped the container of the RDX, not only would they lose all their explosives, they'd lose the ship as well. So it was not something that uh, was very useful. So for several years, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the Germans worked on these two uh, problems, but without any su uh, significant success. After World War I was over, uh, the British began to see war clouds on the horizon for World War II, and they began development work themselves on this same material they read about the Germans had found. They spent several years with several people trying to solve the two problems, but uh, to no avail. In late 1941 and early 42, as you can see, when the Americans were trying to provide supplies to the British, there were 568 ships that were sunk by the Germans, either British or American, in a seven-month period of time. So Britain knew that they had to do something to turn this war around in the Atlantic. So right before Pearl Harbor uh, event in 1941, Britain came to the United States and asked for assistance in developing this RDX explosive. 
So immediately, the U.S. government went to several universities and began some work on the project. But after a few months, in early 42, uh, they checked and found out that little or no progress had been made. The U.S. government had had very good success working with Eastman Kodak on prior projects, uh, particularly uh, photography, especially, especially photography. So they went to Kodak and asked if they could help them with a strategy at least in uh, doing something with this uh, material. Kodak said, well, if you want to uh, want us to get involved, I don't know that we want to, but if you want to, if you desire this, uh, the proper group would be Eastman Chemical Company in Kingsport, Tennessee. So they went to Eastman Chemical and made the request. And Eastman Chemical quickly told them, well, no, thank you. We're not in explosives, never have been, don't want to be. And we know very little about it. But the government prevailed and kept saying, well, even if you don't know anything about this, you know how to deal with major projects. And we'd like for you to advise us, be a consultant at least, on how we go about developing a strategy to deal with the problems involved. So Eastman was contacted and agreed to send a team to Washington, D.C. to meet with the government officials. Uh, the team consisted of four people. Uh, one of them was the chairman of Eastman Chemical Company. Uh, there were two of the uh, senior research and development leaders uh, that were including. And surprisingly, there was a 33-year-old 33, a 33 chemist, uh, many of you may know as David Hull. And obviously, he made quite an impression on the people in Kingsport in his first years working there. So the team of four went to Washington, met with the government people, and agreed to at least initially look into it. So they visited for the next several days with the universities that had been working on the project, and they learned what they could. On the train ride back home, the young 33-year-old chemist uh, took a large uh, uh, folder and sketched out on the back of it what he thought might be a continuous process that could be used for something like this. And he sold his uh, supervisors that were traveling with him on the fact that it might work. So as soon as they got back to Kingsport, Tennessee, they immediately began building a pilot plant. A pilot plant is just a very small scale uh, unit uh, duplicates what a commercial plant would do. And so they designed the plant, built it, and started it up, and it ran amazingly smoothly. So they collected data and got enough information to roughly design, not to really design, but to sketch out to conceptually uh, what a commercial plant would be like. And then they got on the train and went back to Washington. Now all of the amazing things that I've heard and we'll talk about, this was one of the top, I, being a chemical engineer, it's hard for me to comprehend that how in a one month period of time, from the time they got back from the first trip, they did all of this work, working around the clock and building the pilot plant, getting it started up and getting the data and designing the plant. But they went back to the government and made a proposal. The government said, well, you know a lot more about it than we do. Let us make a deal with you. We, the government, will uh, build the, whatever plant to, you want, your specifications, if you will contract with us to operate the plant once it's built. So Eastman surprisingly agreed to do that. And so we had the formation of what became known as Holston Defense. They went back to Kingsport, bought 6,000 acres of land outside of the city, and began work in building this commercial plant. Well, in the years 19, uh, uh, in 1943, uh, they actually built the plant in 42, in the years 43, 44, and 45, they produced some 850 million pounds of this new explosive. Well, that took care of the question about, well, how do you make it large quantities? But what about the shock-sensitive uh, nature of the material? Well, as soon as work started in Holston Defense, work also was started in the research labs in Kingsport to find, and they tested hundreds of mixtures of different combination of things, 
to find something that might reduce shock sensitivity and yet remain the explosive power. And they finally came up with a material that came to be known as Comp B or Composition B. And that's what the name that stuck with it, the reason most people ever heard of RDX for one thing. But they proved that they could take a 60% mixture of the RDX, blend it with a molten 39% TNT and a specialty wax that they had developed. And they could maintain most of the explosive power and yet greatly reduce the shock sensitivity. So as soon as this material was developed, well, it immediately was shipped to the Allies, uh, particularly Britain and the United States, and they put it in all of their torpedoes and depth charges. And there was a dramatic turnaround in the war effort in the Atlantic as a result. We began to sink their subs and uh, their uh, surface ships uh, because of the power of the new explosive. All right, that concludes our discussion about RDX. Um, Nancy Webb, who is uh, a resident of Longview, had a demonstration that we didn't, we don't have it today, but it it was a demonstration of what a a bu bullet could do with RDX propelling it, and how much it would penetrate the deep, the thicker wall of the German submarine. So that was the secret of what was accomplished with the use of RDX. All right, beyond that, we're moving to the second topic, and that is the development of the atomic bomb that Eastman contributed to. Um, and, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way. All right, we'll start by saying the information of splitting the atom and having a powerful result that could be developed into a useful tool for a national state was a common scientific fact that had been shared by various scientists around the world. And the Germans, of course, as had been one of them, acted the, on the RDX, but they also had worked on the splitting of the atom. And the Soviet Union was involved and had a research going on at that time. But if you remember at the beginning of World War II, Germany invaded the uh, country of Soviet Union, and so they were preoccupied with defending their country rather than researching further on the splitting of the atom. Adam, excuse me, <laughs> atom. Uh, and so then you move to Germany, and you can understand they were preoccupied with their by by field uh, warfare. But for, on the east, they were fighting the Russians, and on the west, they were fighting the Europeans. So they were not pursuing it, and there was a lot of conflict because in, the, in Germany, a great deal of the population who were the scientists were Jewish, and this had already created a tension within their country. Japan also had an effort going on their splitting of the atom and how that could be developed as a tool for their national focus. But they had a war effort and after World after Pearl Harbor, they were involved in the war rather than in further research on this and had the major um, effort diverted. The United States was the only one at that time until up until World uh, Pearl Harbor, they were not involved and they were working with how to do this scientifically. And the way the government decided to do it was to set up a committee to study all of the aspects of this particular um, splitting of the atom and how it could be adapted for purposes of national focus. Roosevelt established a committee known as the S-1 Committee uh, in 1939. Uh, there had been some work going on in, in the uh, higher education level about uh, developing the, the process, but in 1939 it was decided that it needed a coordinated effort. So a committee called the S-1 Committee 
strategy one. Now, everything was given nicknames almost to keep it secrecy. And it consisted of six top physicists from the U.S., including uh, Oppenheimer, who was shown here holding the pipe. And he was the uh, gentleman who became famous not only for working with this committee and its work, but also later headed up the uh, development work on the operation of the uh, Los Alamos development of the atomic bomb. So immediately, immediately in 1939, they went to several research uh, universities such as uh, MIT and other Caltech, and they began working on the uh, atom uh, to get basic knowledge and information on, uh, on what could be could, what could be done. You have to keep in mind at this point it was not even conclusive that. Uh, the atomic bomb could be made or it was feasible to even do so. So their, their assignment was to determine if it was feasible and if so, what strategy should they follow. All this changed in 1941 after almost three years of development work in the universities which uh, developed a lot of information on how the different ways of separating uh, and purifying the fuel material that would be used in the bombs and the mechanism involved. But on December the 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, immediately Germany and Italy, because of their covenant with the uh, Japanese, uh, all declared war on the United States and we on them. So the urgency uh, changed dramatically. And sure enough, within about five months after Pearl Harbor in May of 42, the S-1 committee got together and reviewed all the information and decided that it was time to uh, go forward. They had many processes that they had to consider that had possibilities, but they narrowed it down to three. And they were not sure if and uh, which process or if any of the processes would work. So the strategy was to develop all three, three different ways of providing the fuel for the atomic bomb. One of the processes was given to DuPont. Uh, one of the processes was given to Union Carbide. And a third process, all these radically different processes, was given to Eastman Chemical. And the carbide and the Eastman process were to be, the plants were to be constructed in Oak Ridge. All of this work was based upon the finding in 1939 by Dutch physicist Niels Bohr that he proved that the uh, uranium, one form of uranium, could actually be split. He did it, of course, on a very tiny scale, but proved the fact that, as it had, had been calculated by the physicists, that it was possible. So that answered one of the questions. The work was started by the S-1 committee in May of 42, uh, but it wasn't until December, the latter end of that year, several months later, Fermi, uh, physicist, uh, with working with 42 other physicists at the University of Chicago, was actually able to demonstrate that the atom not only could be split, but it could start a chain of reaction that was necessary for an atomic bomb. And he did it in a way that, in a controlled manner, but proved the fact that it would, in fact, be feasible to do so. All right. As the determination was made that these three processes were going to occur, this had to become a governmental decision. And so then Congress got involved and had to choose sites within the United States where this would take place. The first site was chosen was Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and that was because of the geographic conditions that existed there, surrounded by mountains, rivers, protective barriers, it had railroad connections, and preeminently it had an electric connection with the TVA or the Tennessee Valley. And there was a lot of electricity required for all of these processes that were going to be activated. So that was the first site that was chosen. Uh, one little anecdote that I think was funny was the, it came out, and this actually is recorded, the chairman of the finance committee was from Tennessee. <laughs> and he presented his option where this might be and his 
from uh, his comment to President Roosevelt was, where in Tennessee would you like to have it? <laughs> that speaks to our politics, if you understand. Uh, the second thing is, the second site was Hanford, Washington, and that was DuPont. As I show on the slide here, in Oak Ridge, there were sections for Eastman, Union Carbide, and DuPont all, because it was all started there. Then they had a second site for the DuPont process, and it was in Hanford, Washington. And then the third site that was contributing to the development of the atomic bomb was Oak Ridge. Pardon me, was uh, in New Mexico, in Los Alamos. And that was where uh, Oppenheimer and his team were focused, and they had to have the power that was generated from these various processes, but they had to develop the actual bomb itself and test it. And that was all done in Los Angeles, uh, Los Alamos, I'm getting all my words mixed up, uh, in Los Alamos. And that's why it's still a research site at this time. Uh, let me go into Oak Ridge a little further so it'll give you some idea of what was going on. It had 95 square miles of land. It had zero population because the landowners were, their property was bought and they moved out. And it went to 75,000 people there in two years in that 95 square miles. The employees were over 83,000 total. 43,000 were from the Oak Ridge community or surrounding. And uh, no, pardon me, 43 were, were in Oak Ridge itself, and then they bust in from the surrounding area, the 40,000 others. But those are the workers that were involved in that. There is a picture of the kind of construction that they did quickly, and it reminds you of the Army Barracks type photograph. Um, but they were constructing 3,000 3, homes, 20 to 30 a day, all connected. There was no paved streets initially, and they had board sidewalks, uh, 163 miles of wooden sidewalks, because every time it would rain, and this was a rain area, every time it would rain, it would be muddy, and they had heavy equipment working and all of that, so it was quite an ordeal um, to, to do, but they constructed a town that included all the places to sleep and for a single and family, restaurants, stores, it was a community. It had a town hall, a movie theater, grocery store, all of these things. A little bit about Oak Ridge security. There were 4,900 civilian guards, and stories are extreme about the degree of security that this place uh, endured. If you even mentioned a question of what was going on in Building X, that was justification for your being out of there. Um, it was a highly secure facility. They had 700 military police and 400 civilian police, total of 6,000 people dedicated to the security. And they had controlled access as you see the gates and you were stopped and all of that kind of stuff. Um, Kingsport, let's talk about the effect on Eastman. Eastman uh, in Kingsport had 3,500 employees at this time. Now, that was their major chemical and photographic headquarters. After they accepted this project, they added the Holston Defense, and that added 4,500 employees to, which was more than they already had on their employees. And then when they added Oak Ridge, there were that many Eastman employees within that 93,000. And so they, there were 13,000 that were working for Eastman. So Eastman went in that early 40s, within a two year period, it went from a company of 3,500 to a company of 21,000. Now for any of you who have any idea of personnel and all of the various difficulties that go with hiring and education or any large organization, that is overwhelming.
Now to talk a little bit about Eastman's involvement in Oak Ridge. We had several slides we started with to explain this, and we finally decided that we were going to lose our audience if we stayed with that, so we ran it down to two. All you need to know about atomic physics will be in these two slides. This is one of them. The atomic weight, you may remember hearing about in school, but may have forgotten some of it too. The smallest element uh, in, we have in existence is hydrogen. It was given a weight by uh, arbitrary of saying it has an atomic weight of one. All the other elements are some exact multiple because they're all built out of the same type of um, chemical uh, um, atomic particles. So hydrogen is one, carbon is 12, oxygen is 16, up the ladder you go to heavier and heavier. Uranium is the heaviest known naturally occurring element, but it exists in two forms, a lighter form and a heavier form. As you can see, it either weighs 235 times or 238 times the weight of hydrogen. The reason this is important is because in the uranium, in the two forms it has, it has the same number of protons and electrons, each of the materials do, and they react chemically the same way, but the heavier component it's got some extra neutral materials called neutrons that are in the atom and give it some extra weight. But only the lighter weight material, the 235, is what they call fissionable or something that can be bombarded with neutrons and broken apart and form the atomic bomb type thing. 238 is much more stable. So the uranium-235, which you'll hear us talking about, that's the reason we, that it was named that was because of its atomic weight. And it's, it was the only known material to start with. Uh, they have other materials now, but that was the only material to start with that they knew they could break apart and form a bomb with. The other slide just basically illustrates the principle of chain reaction. If we start with the uh oh wrong button. If we start with the uranium-235, which is shown here as a fissionable material, and we bombard it with a lot of atomic particles called neutrons, sooner or later one of those neutrons will hit near the center of the atom. And when that happens, the atom actually will split it forms two smaller elements, releases a tremendous amount of energy, and zillions of additional neutrons. And this is the principle, and of course these atoms, uh, these molecules of, of the uh, fissional material are the ones that surround this. And that's the reason you hear about a critical mass. With uranium, you've got to have about 25 or 30 pounds of uranium together in one spot in order for this to take place. But once you can bombard the first one when it causes the surrounding atoms to break apart as well. And you get the effect of the atomic bomb. So Eastman's role was to take basically an iron ore type rock that was, produced, that was found in the Congo in Africa. And the United States quickly took over all of that area and, and the mines and put a lot of security to keep other governments from coming in. This rock, uh, basically iron with other minerals, contained three-tenths of one percent uranium, naturally. So this was the starting point. So as an example, if we took 10,000 pounds of this ore, which has three-tenths percent uranium, and we would recover all of the uranium, we could get as much as 30 pounds. But that's the good news. The bad news is that 99.3 percent of this uranium is the heavy stuff, which they didn't want. So we're going out to the seven-tenths of one percent is in the 30 pounds of uranium. So if we recover all of that and lose none, we would end up with two-tenths of one pound. So you can see the change in volume here going from 10,000 pounds to get something less than two-tenths of a pound of the product that we need. 
And it all comes to us in a real form, form of a real hard rock. So the government decided based on the university studies that they needed to build five plants for Eastman to operate. The first one took the separated the uranium from the rest of the ore. The uranium existed as a uranium oxide. So the first thing they had to do was convert that uranium oxide to uranium chloride in another plant, which was involved a chemical process of some very extreme corrosive materials. So once they produced the uranium chloride, which they needed to do the separation, they had to purify it in a third plant because they had all types of um, other materials mixed with the product they wanted. So now uranium being the heaviest element known to man, and the chloride to the material makes it extremely heavy. So then they feed it to the fourth plant, which I'll talk about in just a moment, is involving the cyclotrons. And here's where they will, the really critical part comes in, of separating the uranium-235 from the heavier-238 material. But the real trick was getting the union, the uh, uranium chloride vaporized. You've got the heaviest thing known to man in a solid form. So in order to make this happen, they had to pull an almost absolute vacuum. The kind of vacuum they had to pull had only been obtained in very small laboratory equipment up to this point. But as you'll see in a second, it was much larger equipment that was now involved. So as a vapor, they would feed it to the cyclotrons and separate it. And then there was a fifth plant that was uh, involved in recovering any uranium-235 that might have been spilled, or, for instance, uh, material could have gotten on gloves or coveralls or floor sweep or whatever. And this plant recovered that because the material was so precious in such a small supply. So now I'll talk about the, uh, the fourth plant now, which is the uh, cyclotron plant. The uranium chloride was vaporized, we talked about, by pulling an extreme vacuum on the material and fed to the cyclotrons. This is a photograph of a cyclotron. In uh, Oak Ridge, the word cyclotron was never used, neither was the word uranium. Uh, uranium was a nickname Tubaloy, just a made-up name, because if any of the foreign governments heard of the name uranium or heard of cyclotrons, they would know what was going on at this particular site. So the cyclotrons were nicknamed racetracks. And it was because they were in a big oval shape, as you can see here, which is a collection of a huge amount of electrical magnets. So the uranium chloride was brought in as a vapor, and then the particles were accelerated with these electrical magnets to, to go in an oval pattern. And basically, it used the principle of centrifugal force to separate the higher weight uranium from the lower weight material. And the separation they got in these big cyclotrons was about three-tenths of an inch in order the separation between the two materials. There were four of these cyclotrons that were built. Uh, two of them in parallel were called the primary units, and they took, remember, only 